Hello there, welcome to the video. Today we will be looking at the Scotch game and how to counter it. All right, so the Scotch game is the third most popular opening for E4 players, and it can be pretty tricky to get around. So we're gonna dive right in here and take a look with E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight C6, and here this is where the Scotch game begins with D4. All right, they strike in the center just like that. And they leave us with basically no choice here. You basically need to take this pawn because if you do not take that pawn, what's going to happen is they're going to push that pawn up or they're going to capture your center pawn, depending on what your next move is. Um, and neither one of those alternatives is quite appealing. So instead, we need to take right now, avoid the danger, open things up a little bit in the center. They are going to capture with their knight. And right here, a lot of people already go wrong with this opening the most common move for black right now is knight takes d4 and they go queen takes knight and on the surface this doesn't appear to be bad in fact you can look at the eval bar there it says it's just a little bit better for white the thing is practically speaking this is much more difficult for black to play than it is for white to play they have easy development with their bishops and knight and they could castle kingside or queenside if they wanted to meanwhile we're going to have some difficulty developing because where does the bishop go? That's the first one of the first questions, and it's tough to answer since if our bishop moves, we drop a pawn there. The natural move and one of the most popular is knight f6, but we're running into some trouble there after e5, and now our knight has to go somewhere unpleasant. Most of the time, knight g8 is played, and that, was, that just was a waste of our time. So now we're going backwards, literally, and... Meanwhile, our opponent has complete and total control of the center, complete dominance in this game. It's just very much not something we should be looking to play. And yet, this is already something that gives the Scotch game such, such a good look. So most people do trade the knights and give themselves a terrible position. Instead, I'm going to give you a much stronger and trickier move. I suggest bishop c5. And there are a couple of moves that white may try. In fact, there are two main moves here that take up about 80% of all games played from this position. I'm going to start with the more popular of the two, knight takes c6. All right, and this is going to be the main point of our focus here. We are going to play queen f6, and I guarantee you, you will get some games where your opponent either pre-moved their next move, maybe a knight c3, for example, maybe they pre-moved that, assuming you would take the knight. Um, perhaps they think, oh, I can save my knight, and they run away, fleeing the danger. You hope for that. It's not super realistic, but if they do, you are threatening checkmate in one. Queen and bishop both attacking the f2 pawn. If they do not guard the checkmate, then you win. Simple enough, right? That's an easy win on move six. Now, realistically speaking, they're going to play a better move. They're going to play something that guards that pawn, but there aren't that many moves. Uh, for example, this could be one that comes to mind. Just move the pawn up. If you move the pawn up, then you can't take it. But this doesn't end up being very good, generally speaking, as you just capture the knight. And you almost always want to capture the knight with your d7 pawn to open up space for the light squared bishop. The general plan in these lines is to play bishop e6, bring your rook to d8, or castle queenside if possible. And furthermore, in this particular line, your bishop keeps them from castling, so they're going to struggle. And from here, I'm going to put in the most played moves for white, followed by the best counters for black. So knight c3 is the most played move here for white. We go ahead with our plan of playing bishop e6, getting ready to bring the rook to d8, or if they make the wrong move, castle queenside. Depends on what they do. Uh, bishop d3 is most common here, and they are playing decent moves so far. Now we could castle queenside here. I'm actually not going to recommend it just yet, and I'll show you why momentarily. I want you to play knight e7 first, because they often will play queen e2 with the intent of playing bishop e3. So we play knight g6, they play bishop e3, and the point of throwing out knight e7 and knight g6 first was to bring the knight to f4. All right, so now they don't have time to capture our bishop because their queen's in danger. If they move the queen, it's not going to be pleasant. I'm sure some people may attempt queen f2, for example, but after you take the bishop, you... Right now, you're up a piece, and if they recapture, you have knight takes g2 with a fork, winning the queen. So this is certainly appealing right here. We go back a few moves. Most people just take the knight and don't deal with any of those problems. You take back, common move, g3, bring your queen back to f6. People commonly castle, go bishop d4. And over the last few moves, this is slowly getting better and better for black, despite white not making any mistakes. 
This is just a more pleasant position for us as the game goes on. We have a pair of bishops, both active. We're ready to castle whenever we want. Probably queen's side would be safer. We have some pressure um, around their king, especially a2 and the knight on c3. Our queen is backing up the bishop. So a very active position for us, and we would be pretty happy with it. So let's go back to move five, queen f6. So f3 is what we just looked at. Not a very appealing option for white, but it is something people play every now and then. Uh, let's see, the next option I would say to be on the lookout for is bishop e3. This one is pretty simple. You're going to take the bishop, and this is already looking very nice because you get, you just gave them doubled pawns, and now your queen has tons and tons of control over the board. Right? You're keeping them from castling long term. You're still attacking that knight if you need to take it with your queen, which you don't, but it's still nice. And you're targeting the b2 pawn as well, depending on what they do. Most of the time right here, though... You could actually use the queen to further your attack. Right? The top move, if we're going to be literal here, is the, the, the best move is taking the knight and basically playing with the same bishop e6, rook d8 plan that we just saw. I'm going to suggest you go for a slightly less accurate move for higher upside. All right, they're going to go g3, and if they don't, if they don't play g3 and they move their king, then that's also a win because now they can't castle and their king is stranded in the middle of the board. So then you turn around and take their knight and that looks fantastic. So g3, most played and the best move. You take on e4. Most played move here is rook g1 to save the rook, but then you go check. They go here and this basically forces a queen trade because now the queens are pinned to do each other here with the kings right behind them. So you're going to take, and this is not really a problem because you just come back and take the knight in the end, and you are up two pawns in this position. All right, that's more than you end up with in a lot of these positions. Usually it's one pawn or just some space advantage, but this this time you're up two pawns. That's fantastic. Super ideal. And we go back a few moves. They could avoid this by not playing the very popular rook g1 move here. If they do find queen d4, which plays into this, the idea being they're going to win the rook back, if they find all these best moves, you still reach a very pleasant position here where you, you're you not up material, but you have a lot going on here with your queen being on a good square, annoying them here. The bishop is pinned to the king. You're attacking this pawn. You may be getting ready to bring your own bishop out, perhaps g4 or h3. Rook is coming to d8. And meanwhile, their pieces aren't looking to do anything in the immediate future. It's going to take some time for them, and they have to be very careful to not wind up in a losing position. So a lot of potential there. I definitely recommend it. Now all the way back to move five, we got a couple more moves we need to be aware of for white, such as the second most popular move, I believe, queen e2, in which case you follow the main plan. This is a very simple line for black. You follow the main idea. D takes c6, you take the knight with your pawn, opening up space for your bishop, and surprise, surprise, you're looking into bishop e6 and castle and queen side again. So same theme, we get all the space we need, our bishops are going to be great. I'm going to put in the most popular moves again for white, knight c3. All right, and we continue with bishop e6. And then right here, most popular is bishop e3. So now, of course, for for simple reason, we cannot continue with our plan of castling because we don't really want to be down a bishop. So we're going to address this first. We got to pause our current plan and respond to their plan. And we're going to do this in a rather funny way. We have a little bit of a trap here where we play bishop a3. So the idea being, if they take our bishop, we take their knight with check on the king and an attack on the rook. And that would be completely winning. We really hope for that. Uh, unfortunately, most people see the idea kind of straightforward. If, if someone plays bishop a3, if they slow down and think, you're going to realize, oh, there must be a trap there because who would give away a bishop, right? Um, but some people will instantly recapture believing it's a mouse slip. So you have that going for you as well. If they are focusing, and most people are here, they find the, the most popular move, which is castle and queen side. But this is also a pretty big mistake for kind of a funny reason. You can actually still take the knight because the pawn is pinned to the king, which means nothing is going to capture your queen. You're totally good here. Now, they do capture your bishop, but now you capture a3 with check. So one, you are up a pawn. Two, their king is in a terrible spot right now. They have to choose between wandering into the center of the board, which no one ever wants to do, or they choose to go to b1, in which case you win the queen after a few moves with a check on the king while attacking the queen. That's going to go pretty well. I think we'd be pretty happy winning a queen. There's no forced checkmate here, just for your information, but at least you get a queen out of it, right? I'll go back a little bit. 
Obviously, that's not forced, but that is most common, and it is very nice if you get that. If they play solidly, you still get to go with your main ideas of playing bishop e6 and castle and queen side, so we can always fall back on that. That is the nice part about this line. Now, there is one more move I want to put on your radar, and it is the most played move, but it doesn't really, it's not anything you need to fear. All right, they go queen f3, and, you know, it's a nice move. Queen f3. They're offering a queen trade. You, I wouldn't recommend being the one to trade queens here, though. You take, they take, you take, and it's fine, but they solidify their center, and it looks very, very even. I think there are better ways to play this for the sake of trying to win long term. So I would recommend, instead of being the one to trade queens, go ahead and take the knight. So d takes c6, opening up the bishop again, and you wouldn't be surprised to hear that bishop e6 and rook d8 or castle and queen side is still going to be an idea. It really now depends on what they do. All right, most people will trade queens, which is actually not that good. We take back, they help us develop our knight, and we have an attack in the center. We already have a good bishop, which is aimed near the king side. Also very nice. We are still looking at bishop e6 and castle and queen side. So we're going to have all of our pieces be on good, useful squares. And we also have no weaknesses, right? Like they have the e4 pawn that we can target for right now anyway. And our bishops are going to take up a lot of space where they are going to be aimed. But there's nothing for them to come and attack, basically. Everything is nice and solid. So that goes in our favor. We have the positional advantages. There's nothing forced is the only drawback, but it's not like your opponent's going to play like stockfish, right? So this is going to most of the time get you very pleasant middle games where you have plenty of space and can easily move your pieces around. So if we go back a little bit, some people recognize this and decide they do not want to trade queens. So a move I've seen uh, thrown around recently is queen to g3. Just completely avoid it, right? Well, you can just fall back on your bishop e6 idea. I'll put in the common moves for white, knight c3. We go ahead and castle. And we're trying to bait them here with this exact move order where we're hoping they go bishop g5, but we have another nice trick here. All right, take a look at this very nice tactic. We're going to lure the queen away from the bishop by playing bishop takes f2 check. All right, and they don't really have a choice here. All right, they, they've got to take the bishop. We take their bishop and we've gained a pawn out of this. So we're feeling very good about that. And also their queen is stuck here. So if you happen to think maybe they come grab this pawn, we welcome that because we get to checkmate them. So if we trade a pawn for checkmate, go us. Very happy. So that's a quite a nice line. If they don't play into that exactly, even back here, if they don't go for this, uh, and if you feel the need to prevent it later, you always have h6. Um, but aside from that, this is a very nice line where you have your rook on an open file. Your bishop is still in a good square. Both of your bishops are in good squares, taking up a lot of space. Your queen is on a good square, taking up space. At this point, the only thing you need to worry about is getting your knight out, which you can oftentimes just play knight e7, knight g6. Perhaps you bring the knight to the center. The knight being undeveloped is not the biggest concern, though. You're going to be totally fine. There's far more good than bad. The evaluation bar says it's completely even here. I would I would definitely prefer to play black in this position, like nine times out of ten for sure. It's far easier for black to play. So definitely a good counter to the scotch game. Um, All right, that's pretty cool. Now I want to go back all the way to somewhere around here on move four. All right. We've now covered knight takes knight, which is most common. And I told you guys earlier, there's one other move that a lot of people will play. So it's knight takes c6, and this one other move, they take up 80% of the games played from here. Any other move aside from knight takes c6 and the one I'm about to show you, not something you need to be overly concerned with because it's just not common. Other move here is bishop e3. All right. Not really anything to be concerned about. You're basically just going to play the same thing where you play queen f6. And now this is your target, right? The knight. And if they play the second most popular move here and they take your knight, funny enough, this actually will transpose back into something we've already seen where you grab the bishop and you go queen h4 check. They block the check. You take on e4. And we saw this earlier where if they play rook g1, you grab the pawn and later you grab the knight and you're up two pawns. Or maybe they find the best move queen d4 and you still end up in a pretty pleasant position where you take the rook, you take the knight, bring your king to f8, and you get your pieces out and you've got a lot of good play, a lot of space. So if they transpose into that, go you. You already know what to do. If they play the one other popular move here and the best move, c3, 
Well, this is um this is more solid than what we've seen so far because just how solidified they have the center here. They are guarding the knight with everything they can. We're not going to be taking it. Um, we're going to have to change our plans here a little bit. So they've guarded d4 so well, it no longer needs to be our main point of focus. So what we're going to do here is shift our queen one space over to g6. All right, new target acquired. Pawn on e4, currently not defended. Ideally, they would very quickly play a move like bishop d3 and drop this pawn. That, unfortunately, is not super realistic. Most people right here play knight d2, and we follow up with knight f6. So we keep applying pressure here. And most people will play f3. So we're going back and forth here, right? We attack, they defend, we attack, they defend, which is something we like if we're playing black here, because oftentimes white chooses the opening and they are coming out very aggressive and they're attacking and we're defending. So to reverse that here, it's already a good sign that the opening has gone well for us if we're the ones attacking and the ones with initiative and a lot of play. And it doesn't stop here either. All right, they've done a great job trying to keep up defending the pawn, but we're going to play d5 now. All right going forward in the center, continuing to attack e4, and they don't really have a good solution here. If they move the bishop to guard the pawn, that drops the g2 pawn. If they come to b5 to, to pin the knight, same problem, the g2 pawn is falling, and there's plenty going on there that we're going to be fine with. They could, I don't, I don't know, they, they don't really have good solutions here. It's a tough position to be in. But most people decide to just take the pawn, and say, okay, I'm done trying to defend. Let's just trade and get this over with. It's fine. But it's not fine. This is great for us. All right, we're going to take the pawn back, of course. And now we're targeting the bishop. They're just going to move back and try to keep it safe. But the thing is, after we trade here and then they take and we castle, we're not up material. But if you compare the positions, I mean, look at this. We've got a knight in the center. We have a light squared bishop that will easily be developed if we want it to anytime soon. A wide open e file for our rook to slide on over to probably on the very next move. Our knight could also come to f4 if, let's say, say we go rook e8 and they go bishop e2. Knight f4 looks really good there. Our queen is targeting g2 as well, so it seems like their bishop on f1 just can't ever move because it's already got a job to defend the pawn. Basically, we just have tons of space, lots of play. We're not up material, but what do they have? Right, it seems like they're very, very stuck, and if they're not careful, they're going to end up losing very fast. If they make one wrong move, it feels like it's going to fall apart in an instant. And so, that is why... I would definitely support this line. This is only move 11, and we've got tons of play. This is a very good counter to the Scotch game. All of these lines I've shown you here will be good counters to the Scotch game. If I ever play e5 myself, I would definitely play these myself. These are very solid lines, so there you go. I hope they work well for you. So congratulations on learning how to counter the Scotch game. If you're interested in learning how to play the England Gambit and all the trap lines that that involves, then click on this video here. And thank you guys for watching. I'll see you in the next video.